The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Kids, go have some fun. I'm going to invite Jody and Monty up here, the Glossers, two amazing people. And while they're making their way up here, why don't you give them a little love? Because they're awesome human beings. They're awesome human beings. Yep. Yep, yep. So every, we're in a series called For Bismarck. We want to be known as a church that is for our city rather than a church that's against something. We want to be known by what we're for. And every Sunday we are uh, putting together a segment called I Tried, where we're simply asking people who are or, or now they're beginning to come to us because they think this is so cool and say, hey, I, here's what I tried to, to be for my city, to be for my neighborhood, to, to do things to connect with people, to build bridges between uh, us and others or others and God and uh, just talking about an intentional lifestyle where we feel like we're on mission for God. And so you all know the, the, the project that we're working on this summer is called the Great Summer Grill Adventure that I meant to put the video here. It didn't play, darn it. Uh, I had so much fun making it in my... Da oh, ah, eh. oh, we need sound. Let's... Take two, Great Summer Grill Adventure, take two. Okay. Take three. Take three. The Great Summer Grill Adventure. Now you got to look into the horizon just for a moment. <laughs> All right, so these guys had a question for me. They said, well, now we don't do the grill thing as much as the bonfire thing. And I'm like, grill, bonfire, pool, hot tub, as long as there's some element of the earth involved, go for it. So they have, uh, Jody Money have kind of a cool thing they've been doing for some time, maybe even before the, the, the adventure yeah. started, but I, I was so excited for, to hear it, I wanted to share with you. So Jody, uh, try to embarrass your husband as much as you possibly can and share what you guys did, T share how you tried. Um, we have a great privacy fenced yard and our family has always enjoyed just sitting around the fire, just us together and pretty soon the kids were coming to hang out in the backyard with us and I, I just said, you know, let's move the fire pit out front and start inviting the neighbors. And I don't know, it was last summer or the summer before that we decided to do that. And um, that's just kind of our thing to do on the weekends. And we've invited neighbors and we have our friends that are with us tend to join us and we have another neighbor that sits with us pretty much every weekend and we've invited a couple more and we've had to go shopping for more chairs last yesterday and so we're set up wow to what a great problem to have we need more chairs so what's it been like as you i mean we didn't rehearse this question or anything like that but just tell us kind of like um are you glad you're doing it and, and what kind of connections has it allowed you to make to, to go, kind of go from the the great privacy fence to the great adventure of, of the front yard uh, bonfire it has been wonderful. It is a highlight for us. We look forward to it. The kids, if we had, aren't out there setting up the fire pit, they're asking us, are we having a fire? Are we having a fire? You know, they, they're out there getting the wood ready and asking for us to have the fire. Um, my, our teenage daughters will invite their friends over because they know it's just, it's fun and it's relaxing. And we have, we've made some great connections and we have a closeness with our neighbors that we didn't have before and we mm. value it and we enjoy it. Um, and I feel like we can, it's a, it's a time of peace really for everybody. We can kind of forget about all of our cares and all of the stress of the week and just relax and we visit a lot and try to solve a lot of world's problems, <laughs> you know. Monty, anything profound to add? <laughs> I guess for, like our neighbors have uh, Friday night, it was cold, so <laughs> we pushed it late deciding if we were going to do it and the wind died. and. The kids came in and they said, hey, the neighbors are out here. Uh, are you going to come out? <laughs> well, I hadn't finished setting up yet. That's so awesome. they see, as soon as they see us setting up, they're already over there. Um, we've had some neighbors who it's taken a while to get there, but they, they came over. And I told Jody, his name's Monty, too. So there's two of us. <laughs> but we, uh, I told her when they, they left, I said, he's an interesting person, but you don't get to hear about it because they hadn't been over. So you learn a lot about him. So it's amazing. It's fun. You can live next door to, to very interesting people and they you and, and kind of like be lifetime ships passing in the night. So I just love the, the example of, 
of intentional living that these two, with you know, your busy people, busy jobs, busy family life, but you're not too busy to try to make these connections and assuming that you're not living where you're living by accident. So uh, I just hope that this, uh, this kind of thing rubs off, and I would like us to be a church full of people that have time to step outside the privacy fence and to kind of go into the front yard, the front porch, or, or somehow live that invitational lifestyle because that's how the gospel gets shared. Sometimes it's just by people being good neighbors, and, and you'll have no idea where that leads. I bet you guys have had conversations with people at a depth that you would never have otherwise had had you not just opened up your lives and opened up your driveway, your home. Um, so I want to encourage you all in this very privatized society where you can shut the door, shut the garage, turn Netflix on, and, and, and be anonymous to, to rethink that because that's where the real adventure begins. Let's give these two a hand. This is awesome. Well done, guys. So again, if you've got a story that you'd like to share with something that you have tried, and it might be totally nothing to do with the grill or the bonfire adventure, it might have something to do with going bowling with somebody that you would never otherwise gone bowling before with or whatever, just uh, let us know. We'd love every week to share an example of what our community is doing to be more on mission, to be, to be more intentional with trying to, to connect with people. Um, today we're going to do a message called Four Levels of Faith. And I don't want this to sound like this bland presentation. Okay, step one, step two, step three, step four. More of that, I really want to just get your minds thinking about some essential ingredients that are part of a healthy walk with God. And the great thing about the Bible is that the Bible is one story. It's coherent. It's not kind of like um, contradictory and confusing. As you read, you see these elements playing out, and sometimes you can just kind of grab any one story and you start to see some of these themes emerge. And I think if this is especially helpful for us because sometimes we get stuck on one of these levels or to use like a Freudian kind of language, we get fixated on something and don't progress to the next stage of faith. And when that happens, it's not that the first stage or the second stage or the third stage are unhealthy. They're essential. You have to do each of these to kind of have a rounded sense of relationship with God. But if you, if you miss out on one of them, you miss out on a lot of adventure too. So my goal for you today is that if you're on level one or level two, you'll start pushing to that next step because you see it more clearly for what it is. And if you're level three, you'll, you'll start dreaming about level four and praying into it and just kind of taking steps to get there, whether you're nowhere near it or not. Because again, level four is where the adventure really begins. We're going to go into a story uh, from the Old Testament book of First kings. I'm listening on my audio Bible right now to the stories of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, and it's this really huge saga. Uh, one person lives and dies, and, and unlike a movie where you have the main character following all the way through, it's more like an epic where the main character dies all the time, and so the main character has to be God. And we start to see people speaking and living for God for a short while. In this story, there's a guy named Elijah. Uh, Elijah, Eliyahu, means the Lord is my God, is what his name is. He lived at a time with a, a really cruel, nasty, awful, bloodthirsty king called Ahab. And he, uh, Elijah, is the prophet at this time, kind of sent to speak God's words to Ahab. And <laughs> Elijah is a normal name, but Tishbite isn't quite so normal. Sounds kind of kinky, doesn't it? <laughs> Elijah the Tishbite. But it's, come, it's because he's from Tishbe in Gilead. He goes to the king, Ahab, and he said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except by my word. Now, he's a prophet, so our assumption is that he's speaking for God here. Some scholars think that Elijah spoke past his authority and and, and as the one who God has put in charge, it's kind of like a babysitter. You tell your kids they have to listen to the babysitter no matter what the babysitter says or does. Some scholars have mused that maybe Elijah spoke too far here and God didn't really want a drought. We don't exactly know. But in this case, he's saying no to the king. You're, you're wrong, you're bad, and God wants to punish you. There's going to be no rain or dew except by my word. Now, this reflects level one. So in your notes, if you're kind of tracking along with level one, Here's what level one is. It sounds like a negative word, and I mean it today in a not negative sense. 
there's an element to healthy faith that does say no to things. And maybe some of you are at this stage today where you just got to say no to some things. Like if you don't stop saying yes to chemicals, they're going to kill you. They're going to ruin your relationships. You got to start saying no. If you don't start saying no to work, it's going to eat into every remaining ounce of time you have left and energy you have left for the important people in your life. If you don't start saying no to the practices of your coworkers or friends at school that are kind of orient towards self-absorbed, pleasure-seeking, stepping on someone else to get higher yourself, if you don't step away from that, you're going to be stuck in it and you're going to miss out on a lot of positive options that God has for your life. There is a sense in which following God requires a no. In order to say yes to God, there is absolutely a need to say no to false gods, to other options that will undermine your ability to follow him. In our culture, I think chemicals and sexuality are two areas that we really struggle to say no because they're so powerful an attraction for us. And, and yet, it's very difficult for me to, 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 with clean conscience, open up the Bible and, and listen for God's direction if I'm committed to misusing my body and someone else's body or, 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 or mistreating my own temple with, with chemicals that are just hurting me and impairing my ability to relate to the world that God created me to serve can be a, a wide range of things that you just have to step away from. It might even be as simple as gossip or pride, where you, you, you live a life where you, you speak negatively about others to feel better about yourself, or, or a need to never be wrong, to feel okay, where you kind of split reality into it's either, I'm either all good or I'm all bad, and if I'm wrong about anything, it means that I'm all bad, so I have to make other people all bad. We split reality into good and evil, and therefore I cannot be wrong so that you have to be wrong, you have to be evil and bad because I don't want to be. It's a naive, childish, simple way of looking at the world and it comes from our gut, not our brain, but we do it. And sometimes you just have to say, enough. God, I want to follow you and I got to let this go. I talked to a man who said, I, I, was, uh, I took a job in the healthcare profession with an organization and they said, how long have you been smoking? He, during his interview, and he, they could smell it all over him, of course. And, I said, because if you smoke here, you have an annual penalty of $10,000 that you have to pay. He's like, I just quit. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you got to look at God and say, I just quit. I just saw something in you that is so much better. And I know that there's a risk in leaving this behind, but there's a reward in leaving it behind also. Condemnation is okay as long as we're not judging other people. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're not pretending to be God and throwing someone under the bus and telling them they're going to hell and inserting your views upon theirs and dictating and making demands upon their life, but if you're judging yourself, it's good. God, this is wrong. I have to stop. I'm judging myself at level one. And it is a good thing to judge yourself. Because that's how you say no to things. Okay, so this is, this is where uh, Elijah now, he shuts off the valve in the sky. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kerit ravine. Kerit is a Hebrew word that means cut off. Go to the Kerit ravine, the cut off creek east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed ravens to supply you with food there. <laughs> so he's like, you want to turn the water off, huh? Go hang out at a creek for a while and see what happens. And I'm going to give you birds that are going to bring you food. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Karit, the cutoff creek, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat. What a cool breakfast that would be, huh? The bravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, here is level two. What's happening for Elijah is level two. It's consumption. Step two of a healthy faith is an ability to receive what God has for you. 
That's what you're doing right now as you're listening to me reading scripture and, and kind of explaining it to you. You're, you're receiving, you're consuming the good news of Jesus. And our goal for you is not to only be able to do that sitting in rows on Sunday, but to be able to do it on your own so that you, uh, unlike a baby bird who can't feed itself, that's kind of what Elijah is, like a baby bird is the big birds literally come and feed him food. Um, but we want you to be able to go home and feed yourself by opening up the Bible and applying it to your own life and sitting in groups and missional communities and DNA groups and, and being able to, to digest God's word elsewhere. Consuming is an essential part of faith. Elijah is told by God to go here and consume. I am going to provide for you and you are going to be for a time simply receiving what I have for you and uh, we all have to do that. You see, it's not just enough to say no to something. Too many of us know too many Christians, too many people who claim to follow Jesus who simply believe that following God is stepping away from the minefields of don'ts and do's. That that, that the relationship with Jesus is simply saying no to pot, no to crack, no to sex outside of a marriage, no to swearing except the, the real modest swear words, uh, no to pornography, no, well, junk food, there you go, no to junk food unless it's McDonald's on sale, and then you go from there, and then you, you, you start to get kind of sick of it after a while, and this inner craving for pleasure and this inner craving for uh, satisfaction kind of gets suppressed and eventually wells up and you go out and just do something lavishly over the top. And so just saying no is an act of suppression that is going to come back and get you if you're not turning to something and saying yes to it. I'm consuming the good news of Jesus. I'm receiving the affirmation of a loving Heavenly Father. I just watched the movie The Shack last night. Anybody watch the movie The Shack yet? Anybody else crying one-third of the way through the movie? I had to watch it alone. I was weeping the whole time, and I'm not a weeper. And I got tears just streaking down. And I, my favorite part was this man who, who gets to talk to God the Father. And he's angry at God the Father for letting his daughter die. He's furious at God. And he's like, you have a pattern of doing this, God. Your son, and he, got, and he points over to Jesus. Your son, you did the same thing to him on the cross. Didn't you abandon him on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, Jesus, on the cross? You did the same thing to your son. And then the father just turns his arm over, revealing a scarred wrist. And he said, don't think for a minute that I wasn't there. It cost me everything. You and I just need to receive that. We just need to receive it and let the ravens drop it in our laps and just say, God, that's who you are. You're a God who would rather die than be without us. You're a God who was in Christ, the Bible said, reconciling the world to himself. You came, you lived the life I couldn't, you died the death I deserve, and now you're inviting me into a living, breathing relationship with you where I don't just say no, but I say yes. And you, every morning and every evening, you have something for me to live my day and then to end my day, to look forward to the day with hope and anticipation and direction and to end the day with celebration, thanksgiving, and forgiveness for the ways I missed serving you. That's what you want for me. I want to receive. I want to consume. I want to do it here, but I want to do it elsewhere. I want to receive from you. I want to consume from you what you have for me. That's level two. You can't just say no. You got to receive something or you're going to be piling up suppression that's going to just flop out in inappropriate ways. But you can't get stuck there either. God has more, just more for you than just consuming. First Kings 17 continues, sometime later, the brook dried up. <laughs> no kidding. You told them it wasn't going to rain. God said, okay. The brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah again, go at once to Zarephath, the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now, the widow didn't know it yet, but God had still directed or planned for her to provide for Elijah. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. 
he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little jar, a little water in a jar, so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. She went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Now, this is the end of the story. What happened in the meantime, I'm going to talk about with you today because it's powerful. Elijah has gone to this woman, and he sees her collecting sticks at the end of the road. And he says, bring me some stuff, please, and some bread. Now, you just heard the end of the story, that there's this providence that happens. But before that happens, she turns to Elijah and she says, I can't provide for you. I have only enough so that my son and I can eat a meal and then die. So let us die in peace. Now, this is a direct contrast to what God said was going to happen here. God said, I have directed a woman to provide for you. Elijah gets there, and the woman says, actually, I don't have enough for you. I only have enough for one more meal for me and my boy. We got to have a little bit to eat, and then we get to die. And, and Elijah's like, well, okay, wait a minute. This doesn't square with what God has told me. So here's what he says to her. Or this is rather her quote for him. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, and there we may eat it and die. This woman is stuck at level two. Her best hope being stuck as a consumer was to consume until she died. And you don't know it or you maybe don't know it, but you are surrounded by people every single day of your life who honestly believe that this is their best case scenario. They may have more than one meal left, but they truly honestly believe that day in and day out, their best hope is to consume until they die. Whether it's travel or recreation, whether it's media or whether it's chemicals, their absolute best hope, whether it's achievement and the praise that you can consume based on achievement or whether it's recognition, popularity, or fame, the, the, the best hope is that they might receive, consume from others and from God and die. See, this is level two. Elijah was on level three, which you saw was missional obedience. He wasn't just stuck consuming. God told him, I want you to go to Zarephath. I want you to talk to a widow. She's going to provide for you. You're going to make a connection with her. And here's the things that's going to happen. You're going to be bonfiring in the front yard of this lady's house. And here's what's going to go on. Marshmallows, everything. He's telling Elijah, I want you to do certain things for a purpose. And Elijah does it. Many, many people have not yet progressed to the step of actually being able to hear direction from God, to open their Bibles and say, you know what, I really believe that because this verse says that, I'm going to make a change. To sit down with a circle of, of men or women and say, you know what, I, I, I have this issue, and to hear some feedback and pray and say, you know what, after doing this, I'm glad we talked because I, I know what I got to do right now. I got to make a change. And the change is never just again, to do the right thing. Because that means if you're just saying no to something, what level are you at? If you're just saying no to something, you're on level one. If, if you're just following God to avoid the wrong thing and to do the right thing, you're stuck on level one. But we have already moved past that. You're receiving and consuming. So this level is much more about intentional obedience that allows good potential to happen in your life. Sometimes when I talk to people who are struggling with addiction, one of the things I say to them is, is that this, this is going to beat you if it's just level one, if it's just pushing away and saying no to something that's stronger than you are, you're going to lose. You need something to grab onto, 
hold on for dear life, ride the wave of God's adventure to live for. Sometimes it, it isn't even enough for a, a, a parent who's addicted to look at a child and say, that's enough. Sometimes you, you have to blow the top off the world and see the Creator's purpose alive and well despite my failures, and I need to get help so I can get on track with Him as a dad, as a mother, as a spouse, as a, as a sibling, as a coworker, as a student. I got to say yes because I have a plan that God has for my life, and I want to follow that plan. So just saying no to something, it's not enough for you. If you're struggling with temptation, let's say you're married and you're struggling with temptation to either indulge in pornography or to, to have a relationship outside of your, your marriage, I guarantee you that's going to get you. Unless you sense God's power and purpose pulsating with a plan for your marriage. That the cross of Jesus Christ, this groaning, dying, butchered man hanging for the sake of the world, if, if you see a way where that act plays out in your family, you're going to hang in there because you want to see it happen. So missional obedience is, is just what the Glossers talked about a minute ago. They decided, you know what, we could do this in the backyard. Let's do it in the front yard. I feel like God is calling us to connect with our neighbors. I feel like God is calling me, Elijah said, to connect with this woman in Zarephath. We don't know if God said it audibly. Monty, Monty and Joe, did, did God actually write something on the wall of your house? Where are you guys? Did he write something on the door? Did he yell at you? Did he scream at you? Did you get an anonymous letter from him? You just got a sense, right? My guess is that's how it was for Elijah. We just had this sense that I think we think God wants this. And when you obey God, not just to say no to something on level one, but for the purpose of what he plans on level three, you're pushing the boundaries of some pretty cool adventure that are just, just one whiff away. Because what God will do through that intentional obedience that you know is not to just to be okay with God, but to, to watch God work, that missional intentionality, you are on the cusp of something big. And that leads to level four. The consumption contrast. If you, if you want to get away from level two and not get stuck there, you, you have to, instead of receive, give. What he begins to do is he begins to disciple this woman. He begins to help this woman understand what it looks like to have a living, breathing, dynamic relationship with a God who can provide. He begins to disciple her, help her to learn how to be a follower of God. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. This is why we challenge people to give offering, to tithe the first 10% of their income because we want you to have the experience that, that he is inviting this woman to have of if you trust God with your first and best, watch and see what he does with it. Don't wait until you, to see if you have something left to, to share with a charity, to give to a person in need, to, to, to help fund the mission of a church. Make that a priority. We, we challenge folks to get on a digital giving plan for the summer so that whether you're traveling or not, generosity happens consistently and that you put something out there and give God a chance to bless you as, you, as he watches your faithfulness. He says, you know what? I, I, I know that you're worried about not having enough. Make a cake for me anyway. I'm going to show you what it's like to follow this God. I am discipling you. Then make something for yourself. Consume second this time. Share first, give first, consume second. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So I know there's a drought and I know that's why you're hungry and I am going to be with you as a living testament to the fact that God is going to provide for you all the way up until this, the garden starts growing again. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. And what do you think her neighbors see? All of a sudden, this poor widow with no job and no food is eating every day and having cake parties with Elijah in her front yard. And maybe, I would imagine, invited the neighbors over for I mean, this, this thing, they're not going to run out. There's no concern about having enough. So why not invite your neighbors? Why not invite your friends? Why not have a party every Saturday morning because you've got 
something to share. You're not stuck saying no. You're not stuck consuming for yourself. You're acting intentionally with obedience and watching God provide. The flour is not used up. The oil didn't run dry. Keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Here's something about level floor. Discipling others leads to abundance. That's the main reason that Surprise Church set a goal to plant a new church within three years of our birth itself because we wanted an abundance mentality. Too many churches tighten their belts and tighten their belts and tighten their belts and say, well, we're not sure if we're going to get by, not sure if we're going to have enough. We want to say, we got enough people to share. We got enough money to share. We're going to be an abundance church because we believe in a God who fills up a jug of oil and says, I'm going to keep providing for you until, it, until the rain comes. We want our people thinking that way. We want our people thinking, as the Gloucester shared, with, a, with an a, abundance mentality. We have something to share. We're not worried about having enough. We have something to share. And we have each other. If we ever run out, we got each other's back. See, consumption leads to scarcity. That's where she started this story. I just have a little bit of, of what I have. I have enough for one more meal. I have enough to consume I've, until I die. My life I have mapped out. And when it's gone, I'll be gone. And it's... It's over. That's where she started, right? She was on a very low basic level of consumption, early stage level two, and then she meets Elijah who desires to disciple her. So I want to ask you, what, what, what step do you think she's at now as she ends the story? She's, she maybe is not living in ultimate sin, so she, she had already passed the condemnation level. She was stuck in consumption, and now Elijah's telling her, here, I want you to do this and do that and do this. She started taking steps of missional obedience, and she's watching while Elijah pours into her. She's watching a guy not worried at all about consuming, completely confident that God's going God's to be there and take care of him and provide for him and work in his life and be active in his life. He's on level four, turning with the confidence of God to invest in her. She's watching God, follow through, show up, provide, provide, provide. Again, I believe that the neighborhood in this small town probably is just amazed at this and getting to taste the fruits of this providence. And I just wonder, at the end of the story, where is she at? Having watched a person who thinks this way, living in close proximity, discipling her past level two up to level three, what do you think she does next? Or another way I ask this, what might she and her son do next in their neighborhood? How did they use their grill, their oven, their bonfire? How, how did they use their front porch? How did they relate to their neighbors having spent day in and day out relying on the generosity of a God that is abundant? And what would you look like as a student, as an as a employee, as a boss, as a spouse, as a, as a child, in a family, if you thought this way? Would you be less impulsive? Would you be less impatient? Would you be less absorbed with getting by and getting through for yourself? Would you be less prone to take a shortcut? Would you be more excited about the adventure in front of you as you take steps of missional obedience to win the right to pour into someone's life by discipling them. I got a feeling that the next thing that these guys did was start discipling their neighbors. Lots of stories in the Bible about Jesus saving someone and they're like, I want to follow him. He's like, no, 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 I want you to go back to your hometown and tell people about me. See, Jesus is in the oil business. In North Dakota, that makes good sense. He's in the oil business. He is good at providing for people when they don't expect him to, when they just put the empty jar out there and say, well, I'm just going to keep pouring and just see if he keeps providing. Next week, we're going to hear a story that you're not going to believe about a, a, another woman and another bunch of oil that God miraculously provides. And I wanted two weeks in a row on this because I truly believe that God has abundance in store for this community and for the cities of Bismarck, Mandan, and Lincoln. 
And I want to be representatives of that. I want our church to be representatives of a God who is not a scarcity God. I don't want a church stuck at level one or level two or level three. I want a church that pushes all the way to, the, to an ability uh, to disciple others. Our vision as a surprise church by the year 2020 is that we want to have a thousand disciple makers on three different campuses with 25 missional communities of people who do life together outside of church. Now, that sounds insane because at that point we'll only be six years old. But I, I, again, that's a scarcity concern. I'm not concerned about God's ability to do it. I just want to point us in the right direction and say that's the kind of God we have. The woman could have looked back at Elijah and said, this is not possible, Elijah. The jug is empty. I'm dying. And Elijah would have just pointed up and said, God is just fine. So as, as the band comes up and we close, I just want to ask you, is there an area of your life where you think God is dying? Is there an area of your life where the jug is empty, there's no oil left, there's no gladness left, there's no healing in your house, there's no hope in your relationship, there's no fullness, there's no purpose, there's just dry, rigid boredom or pain? Is there an area of your life where you're just ready to consume until you die, to gather a few sticks, cook a little cake for yourself and your son, having nothing left to share with anybody else, having an ability to only focus on the little bit you have until there's none left, where you need a man or a woman of God to tap you on the shoulder and say, could, could you join me in looking up for a minute? Go get your jar. And you're going to be surprised that it's full of oil. You're going to be surprised that this sucker isn't going to run out, that God is not going to just decide to be with you for a day and just run out, run empty, run dry. God is not like that person who gave up on you. He's not like that boss who uh, refused to give you the promotion. He's not like that teacher who stared down her nose at you and just didn't believe in you. He's not like that parent who couldn't control their temper. He's not like that friend who turned their back on you. He's not like that coworker who gossips about you. He is, Scripture says he wakes up every morning with mercy on his mind, with a, with a the, the jar ready to pour into your life. He's in the oil business. He's tapped the greatest reserve in Jesus. He's ready to fulfill you. He's ready to give you life. And if there's a part of your life where you're thinking scarcity, where you're thinking consumption, it's time to take steps forward. Where you think, God, what's the step that I need to take to be obedient to you, to, to watch your mission unfold in my life? What's the step that I need to take to be ready to pour into other people so that I can be the jar and you can fill me with oil and that because I'm there, people have you. Because I'm there, oil is getting poured. Because I'm in the room, you're in the room being represented. People are smiling. People are happy. People are full of life because you're pouring through me. I'm not stuck consuming. And when you're overflowing, you've got enough, you get to pour. Would you stand? And as we sing this last song about a God who is greater than anything we face in the world, greater than any concern we have, greater than any burden we carry, who provides more than we need, I want us to leave here after singing this celebratory song as people who are, who are so overflowing. You're, just, you're worried about spilling and making a mess. You've got to find a place to plug in and, and share serve. Let's pray. God, make us an abundance community. I pray that by 2020, there are a thousand people who call surprise their home who know how to pour out oil in their workplaces and homes and neighborhoods and schools. I pray that there are a thousand people who can take someone by the hand and walk them past condemnation, past consumption, past missional obedience to the point where they are disciple makers themselves. Don't just let us be disciples, Jesus. Let us be disciple makers. And let the world never be the same. In Jesus' name, let's sing, folks.